Hi everybody. Um, obviously, as David has explained, I'm just going to run through um, reasonably quickly, probably about 20, 25 minutes, just how we've tackled mobile and flexible working in Fife Council, um, and how that uh, how taking that forward in the way we have, we've kind of achieved some pretty significant benefits out of the back end of it. Um, so what I'll do is I'll talk about how we've approached that project, um, and I'll also go on to talk about how we've we've taken some technical and, and kind of architectural decisions around the project that have helped us to not only deliver benefit but also also put in as good stead for for a phase two of the of the program, which is actually just about to kick off in the next month or so. Um, so. Without further ado, I'll, I'll just crack on. Um, before I start talking about Fife, I'd like to just talk about a survey that we did back in summer 2014, um, which we haven't got an update on, unfortunately, but it, but it was it was an interesting survey in as much as it told us that, that councils had, um, many councils got to a point with mobile working where they'd done it in spot uh, implementations, so that, you know, particular parts of the business had seen an advantage in, in switching to mobile working technologies. Um, but they hadn't, um, many hadn't as yet that developed a formal corporate program around it or looked at it as an enterprise-wide um, program. What we have, uh, but, but a number of councils at that stage were looking at that, and I know that from conversations with councils, they have taken forward or are very actively taking forward now business cases around an enterprise-wide mobile working program, um, very similar to what we've uh, what we've, we've done in Fife. Um, but of the councils that had taken forward mobile working, the the benefits were clearly there. Productivity being uh, one of the key benefits amongst amongst many, um, and in a workforce, you know, in a situation where many councils are reducing workforces, um, getting better productivity and getting more out of skilled workforce is actually top of the agenda. Um, but it, but it also resulted in, in much more um, much better in customer service around particular services as well, particularly fuel-based services. Um, and it also allowed obviously staff to work more flexibly. Again, something that uh, that as councils and many of them were keen to take forward. We started off with a mobile and flexible working pro program and we, we quite deliberately split mobile and flexible um, into two distinct definitions. Um, while they're two sides of the same coin and a lot of the technical and, and, and kind of um, process solutions are, are similar, um, they were very, two very distinct um, parts of the program. Flexible working for us was about being location agnostic. In other words, there were a number of fixed locations where you could work, um, but uh, it was, you know, but the, the the objective was to obviously enable people to work in in any office within within Fife or at home, and by and large try and get as much of the same experience as they could. Uh, that was primarily around reducing office accommodation, uh, something which we've been fairly active in doing and reduced from 90 uh, corporate sites down to 30, and we're looking to reduce still further. Um, but it was very much, the benefits around that were very much around condensing office space, um, and we adopted an 8 to 10 working um, ratio between employees and desks, uh, and again, we're now looking at potentially extending that to 7 to 10 um, on the back of some further information that we've got in terms of the way the desks have been utilised and, and, and an increase in mobile working. Talking about mobile working, that, that's uh, where we started to look at location free. In other words, it wasn't just about home or office, it was about working in the field within Fife. Um, and a significant part of our workforce, that is their working day. They don't work in an office. Um, and that has some challenges for us as IT because that, that extends what we are doing into a much wider population, uh, which typically didn't use technology in the way that they're now using it to as a key part of their day. So the program itself, it started in 2010 as a five-year program, but we were asked to accelerate that to three years, um, which uh, which was in the end doable. Um, we started with a year zero, which I'll talk about in a, in a second, which was about understanding where we were, a bit of a stock take around the enablers and some gathering some of the diagnostic information that we, we needed to get the right solutions in place. An initial business case was built on it was was only built on 2,680 staff, which is a which at that time was uh, was around seven or eight percent of the workforce, um, and it was primarily aimed at the a, a significant proportion of that were office workers who were going to be asked to work more flexibly within different locations, um, with with a with a number of uh, mobile working staff amongst that. 
that then extended to 7,000 staff as we, as we as we extended the building, um, as we extended the flexible working to incorporate more buildings. Um, and ultimately, this will affect 11,000 staff or more as we roll out mobile working to its, uh, to its full extent. The initial programme budget was set at 12 million, um, but after, the, after our stock take at year zero, we decided that actually what we needed to spend was somewhere in the region of 6 million. And our initial benefits were estimated at 19.24. Um, a significant chunk of that were around office rationalisation, but also around productivity savings from mobile and home working. Um, at the end of the three years, we had 20.8 million um, logged as benefits against the project. And as I say, there's more to come on the back of the, the technology and the systems and processes we've rolled out as we go into a phase two. And it was nominated for best. It was actually received best efficiency initiative in 2014 from APSI as a kind of recognition to the program team of the work that they've done. We, we, I talked about year zero. Um, this is a definition from Wikipedia about year zero, and for those who knew what happened in Cambodia back in 1970, this is where, this is where this definition comes from. It wasn't actually um, as dramatic as this, um, but there was a. The, the, that there was a, a definite need for us to stop take and look at the cultural aspects of what we were doing um, and get the best out of that, not necessarily starting wiping everything clean, but starting with the basis of understanding where we were, what was working and what we needed to build on. So that was an, it was basically a broad look at the enablers that we had or we needed to put in place. Now this this list here is 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 the is the range of things that we looked at. Um, obviously, the technical platform is what we had in terms of technology at the time. Um, so, for instance, we did have a unified printing solution where um, you know any you could issue a print from any any machine in Fife and it would print on a number of printers which you could pick up anywhere in Fife. Um, so there were some things that we already had in place which helped us mitigate the overall program costs. We looked at each. HR policies and approaches, um, which needed to be adjusted in terms of the way that uh, we, we, we put in place contractual homeworking for a small number of staff, around 20 to 30 at, at this point in time. But that obviously meant that we had to change and look at the ways that, that, that things like health and safety and some of the policies and, and approaches were, were kind of um, needed to be revised, I suppose, as a, as a result of that. We also looked at cultural readiness, and, and it was key that we, we kind of developed some you know, real uh, effort in terms of staff communication because clearly uh, staff culturally were used to working at one desk and turning up at the same point at work every day. And there was some flexible working and there was some working at home and whatnot, but it wasn't um, it wasn't really part of the culture. So we had to look at, you know, what that meant in terms of challenging the culture of the organisation and the way people worked. An important part of that is actually reflected in the next point around management culture. Managers uh, very very much um, managed by presenteeism and not by outcome. And we had to challenge and change that. Managers very used to having their team around them and, and managing that way. Had to think about managing in quite a different way. And that actually meant not only um, changing the management style and approach, but it also meant them being much more savvy about the technologies that were putting in place. So things like link and presence management and be able to use that to, to contact team members and not be reliant on the fact that somebody was sitting next to them. We also looked at uh, the facilities management side of things. Um, we implemented things like booking of hot desks and whatnot. So it was key that we had to get the, the kind of the facilities management reception front desk type staff on board with this uh, and understand what we could and couldn't do in terms of um, in terms of getting them as part of the service uh, delivery and service offering. Uh, and we're now looking at the mobile working and, and looking at ways we can actually have the front desk staff have fit, fitted out with kind of swap out equipment for people who've got mobile you know, smartphones or tablets, so they can essentially take a broken tablet to the nearest front desk and get a, get another one in return. Um, that's quite challenging technically, we're still working through some of the, the ins and outs of that, but um, but what is in place, for instance, is um, things like full booking and concierge and people are able to go to the front desk and, 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 and are able to work um, out of any out of any bill, either by getting access to a touchdown PC or getting access to Wi-Fi or whatnot through the, through the front desk. And we also looked at the, the budgets and processes for state sustainability. Um, one thing that, you know, in my in my experience is not something we do very well within councils often is is look at the long term and look at how we can actually sustain and sustain and um, 
um, put in place total life cycle costs for projects like this. So we looked around how we were going to um, change what we did in that respect because we were very traditional as a council at that point. Um, services had their own IT budget, they refreshed their own PCs, um, they decided where they were going to put them. Obviously, the workstations that we have in place now on desks are not, are not the ownership of a particular service, they're the ownership of the council and used by the council as a whole. So we had to look at the way things were budgeted for um, as part and parcel of that. So the second part of the year zero was around the diagnostics, was getting some decent baseline information that we could use to develop the solutions and also baseline the benefits. So for a number of uh, workers, we, we carried out day in the life of studies um, to actually understand exactly how mobile technology and flexible working could actually enable what people are doing or what challenges they might face um, in, in, in doing that, you know, where they're tied to a filing cabinet or, or whatnot. So there was, there was a, the dialo studies were actually quite key in us understanding what that was, you know, what, how that was going to land. We also uh, did a bit of a, a study on office utilisation and understanding just how many desks were empty at any given time, and that's why we arrived at the eight to ten ratio. Which, even at that point, um, a lot of people were sceptical about, but it has proven itself in the sense that, you know, typically two out of ten desks at that time were, were just not occupied, probably more. Um, and we also took the opportunity to baseline the business benefits, which is why we were able to put a fairly decent handle on what we'd actually achieved as a result of this programme. And uh, that, as I say, the, the necessary, I suppose the necessary outcome of that was we were able to sort of segment the workforce into a set of standard operating models, if you like, and, and a set of technology and, and, and uh, working type solutions around that, or work smart solutions around that. But as I say, a lot of this was about building on what's there, um, but we, we used the first place year to, to kind of conduct a bit of a gap analysis around all of these things, technical platforms, the cultural readiness, and put in place a plan to address any gaps that we saw. And that was where the initial budget from 12 million we, we eventually ended up at six. If I can talk about flexible working um, briefly, we, we found that that was primarily about the culture. You, you know, as I, say, as I touched on earlier, you're, you're asking folk who typically turn up at the same place of work day in, day out, to consider working in a different way. Um, but you're also asking the managers to consider managing in a different way. Um, and that, those two things were the, the cultural change that we really had to address uh, and put some effort into. So for instance, in the managing uh, aspects of it, we actually ran a set of courses and, and sessions around uh, managing mobile workers, managing managing flexible workers, so that managers could get their head around how that might work and how that might um, how that might land in terms of the way the change in the way they do things. And we also had to look at ways of supporting workers, not just support in terms of the, the kind of employee type support um, that, that managers and peers would offer, um, but also the ways that we would have to support things technically. Um, again, it's a bit of a challenge and we have to adjust things if people aren't you know, turning up at the same desk every day. So for instance, if they sit down at a PC at the moment and it's not working, um, they will move on to the next PC. Um, but we had relied on, previously our support method relied on people sitting at the same PC and waiting for our call, so we clearly had to think about how best to support things and make adjustments in those types of scenarios as well. We also found that filling in some of the gaps that I talked about earlier was, was, was harder than we thought, um, but it was essential. So you know, some of the technical enablers we were missing, for instance, we, we had a fairly, um, um, how shall I put it, highly customised desktop offering. So, People typically had, they sat down at a desktop every day, and, you know, to give you a try example, they probably had their own wallpaper, their own set of applications on, on that desktop. They couldn't move to another desktop. Um, we had to standardise and, and change the way that we deployed things and change the way that we operated. Um, so some of these gaps were, filling these gaps was, was harder than we thought. We had a lot of work to do in some aspects, particularly um, in some of the technology aspects, but also, um, Taking, taking on both things like staff communication and whatnot, that was, it was time well spent, but we, we had to put a significant amount more time into that than we initially planned. We found that in flexible, the productivity benefits were at best partially there. Um, condensing people into fewer buildings doesn't by itself deliver productivity benefits. Um, it might mean that some people can work a bit closer to home and, and, and that kind of thing, but it, it doesn't actually drive productivity benefits. The benefits were, as I said earlier, primarily about reducing the cost of buildings and bricks and mortar. 
We also found that while the population was moving uh, and we were trying to standardise the equipment to enable them to move, that was quite a complex thing for us to, to, to get heads around. And when we had to work very closely, uh, particularly IT and uh, the office and uh, facilities management folk, to make sure that plans were integrated and that we were not tripping over each other in terms of what we were doing. And we also, uh, as part of a, a separate um, project on the go at the same time, we also moved a lot of our services and IT online, so we developed a service catalogue approach which actually enabled this um, quite well in the sense that we, we found that people who, for instance, wanted to work remotely, they could actually consume that, so they could actually request and, and get that service delivered via our, our service catalogue approach, our online service catalogue. And that has been essential as well because it does two things. Not only does it make it more accessible, but actually, you know, for a given work style, it enables people you know, it enables people to select the appropriate products and get those uh, get those delivered and get those set up. And we didn't actually take a lot of time in considering the paper aspects of it. We didn't, alongside this, digitise a lot of our documents. Um, and we got away with that, but uh, we are now looking seriously at, um, at some of the limitations of what we've delivered in terms of people still being tied to filing cabinets in some respects. And we're now looking at, you know, really getting serious about an electronic document management to, to truly um, free up the, the flexible working aspects and, and tackle that one last piece of um, of, uh, of infrastructure, if you like, that keeps people tied to a particular location or a particular office building. Um, moving on to mobile, um, we've found that that is where there is a, reach, a fairly rich stream of productivity and other savings. Um, where, where we have rolled out mobile working, we've found that operatives who are, you know, field workers are actually you know, typically doing 20 to 30 percent more jobs per day than they were previously. Um, part of that's down to the technology and I'm not having to come back to base, but a significant part of that was, as I'll touch on this again later, looking at the business processes and making sure they were mobile ready, mobile fit. Um, obviously, people who don't have to come back to the office um, to pick up more files or, or, you know, do what they need to do in terms of the middle of the day or the end of the day stuff, um, to punching data into systems, uh, they are spending more time with customers uh, out in the field. And we've also found that um, where we've integrated things like rostering and scheduling solutions, we've had to, we've, we've had, we've been able to cut down a lot of the back office and administrative uh, functions. As I said, there's, there's been nothing that's reduced the number of clipboards on, on van dashboards than, than this project because none of that paper exists anymore. Things are typed in live to systems and there's nobody back at base taking a clipboard and, and kind of typing the data into a system in the areas that we've ruled this out. But as I said, mentioned earlier, we, we we took the initial business case and uh, delivered to um, two key business areas around uh, building services in, in the trades uh, and have re you know, significant benefits out of that. We're now looking at 20 to 25 further business areas within the council as part of a phase two. So things like parks and open spaces and, and countryside ranges and those kind of people um, and housing maintenance officers and basically extending our mobile and flexible program into those areas now. We've also found that there's a second wave of benefits around management information, um, particularly in the areas that we've ruled out um, kind of process-driven work. So, so for instance, our typ typical day for one of our mobile working um, gas fitters is that they log in at the start of the day in their handset. Um, the, that, at that point, the the Back at the back at base, the automated roster and scheduling provides a first job based on criticality and where they are. Um, they will then say they've got the job and they're on their way, and they, 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 they type that in hand, or they basically just know that status in the handset. Then they say they've, they're, they've arrived at the job. Then, then obviously they, they fill in whatever they need to fill in in terms of gas certificates or whatnot, and then they, they say that's me finished the job. And each one of these kind of process milestones, if you like, are are noted within the within the handheld. So we're starting to get some really interesting benefits now around um, how long it takes to do two typical jobs. And, and for instance, you know, the guys in building services will tell me now that they find that certain types of boilers, they find that, that, that kind of it, that getting information about how it takes much longer to service one type of boiler than it does in another. And that's the kind of thing that, we think, you know, they could have gathered in some sort of time and motion study, but they're now getting pretty much real time uh, for every job as part of the process. Mobile, as I say, is primarily about the process. We had to do 60% of the benefits, I would say, came from re-engineering the process 
the, the workers in, who work in a field are, are basically used to mobile working. It's not a cultural adjustment for them. But to get the most out of mobile technology, we had to look at the process that they were using it and make sure that, that process was, was slickly implemented in terms of the technology. So we, we talk about 60-40, where 60% of the business benefits were around changing the process and 40% were around the culture. So again, a, a classic example of that is we put a lot of, um, before we put the automated schedule in, we, we had about 20 to 30 clerical staff temporarily assigned down at Hayfield Depot in Kokori, and those people were, they were essentially the human computer. They were running the automated process and, if you like, or the, the scheduling and rostering that we would eventually automate in the technology. Also, it comes with privacy concerns. You know, the first time we said we roll out things which track people's locations and that kind of thing, um, the unions got involved and said, you know, how are we going to tackle with the fact that people think they've been watched? Or, you know, so we had to, you know, we had to get involved at that and get involved pretty proactively at that stage in making sure that unions and, and workers were on board and that they had a degree of control over the technology as well. So, you know, basically informing them how they could, uh, you know, to switch off the technology at the end of the day and and, and to to consider. Um, and, and to know the fact that you know we did we did have the right to to kind of track the location of the technology, but we had to you know let's see we had to get through those conversations and make sure that everybody was happy. Ways of support, as I talk, touched on earlier, is a big concern. You know the technology is now integral to to a set of the workforce that wasn't before. Uh, in terms of IT support, that for us is a big big consideration in terms of making sure that you know if the technology is integral they'll get easy and uh, quick ways of swapping in and out handsets and as I say as touched on earlier we're now looking at whether or not we can just have um, handsets available at various touch down points within Fife so they can go to the nearest you know, front desk and just get a handset. But the, probably one of the most important things that we that we talked about earlier on, and again I'll touch on this in the way we designed the solutions, but we didn't we didn't want to fall into the app trap. And what I mean by that is that you know every every uh, solution provider that you've got, in, you know, in terms of providing systems for councils, uh, has got their own mobile app version of what they do, or certainly a significant chunk of them do. But um, but that has its implications. Uh, and we had in previous iterations of mobile working, um, fallen foul of of um, Providers who would only support certain ha certain handsets. Uh, so when we wanted to roll out an, another application which used a different handset or a different operating system, uh, we were coming a bit unstuck with uh, having to provide multiple handsets to to service things. I think we would do, I'm sure we would have ended up with a utility belt uh, for mobile workers with one device for every application. Um, so we we came to the conclusion quite quickly we didn't want to do it that way. Uh, and again, I'll touch a bit on how we actually did approach it. Uh, the architecture that, that we used to build this on was, was based on some fundamental design principles. So as I said there, we didn't want to be tied to a particular device. Um, we wanted to leave it open that, uh, for instance, the technology changed towards Windows away from Android or towards Apple away from BlackBerry or whatever, that we were in a position where that was just a device. It, wasn't, it was just a window on the solution. It wasn't something that was pertinent to the, the solution itself. At the bottom of the di diagram there as well, we talked about it being application independent. We didn't want the mobile apps tied to the particular look and feel and flavour of a particular application. We wanted that independence to, to, so that from a user pers perspective, it's a consistent look and feel, regardless of what they're using under the hood to, to record the information. In the middle there, there's a the set of five building blocks, which is now six, which I'll cover off in a second, um, which with a standard building blocks for us. So a mobile device management solution to make sure that we could actually build and manage the devices in the field. Uh, email, unified comms and collaboration, basically integrated with our Outlook and Link technologies. Um, mobile application development, what I would say about that is we do have a total mobile as our mobile application development platform, but it's very light touch. It's not that I've got people in IT coding at a great depth. Um, the, the application development they do is very quick and very agile. Uh, obviously, integration tools uh, is key to this if you're going to connect these mobile solutions to back-end systems. Um, and finally, rostering and scheduling, um, the ability for us to automate the, the kind of rostering and scheduling activities in, in the workforce. And so we do, we're doing that now with building services. Uh, we're now looking at home care, which is another key area for us in terms of getting rostering and scheduling right. And the other bit that's, that's in that mix, which is a six building block, if you like, we just recently added is around logistics and geolocation. So being able to to, to, to basically make decisions or, or, or route things on the basis of where the device or the operative is at. Um, again, early days on that, but um, but we are going to take that technology forward into the next phase. 
So we developed, I think, an into four user scenarios based on that technology and based on that architecture. We talk about mobile access, which is the type of um, type of scenario that I that I'm in. I, I don't have a, a need to integrate with business applications. I just need something which enables me to access the council network and files and basic applications such as email and calendar. Um, so I'm I'm an example of a mobile access user using an iPad. Um, we also had a range, so one step up from that in complexity was, was, was that plus the ability to either take documents with you, so again our members are probably an example of this where they have committee papers and whatnot manually synchronised on or automatically synchronised onto the device, um, or the ability to capture simple data and forms and just push that back to, to, to one central, central base. Um, next step up from that is integration with a business application. So that's where somebody is basically using the mobile mobile app, if you like, or a mobile development on top of one, an existing business application. And then the, the fourth user scenario is where they're integrated with an application, but they're also using some of the smarts on the device itself. So we're using things like routine roster and resource scheduling and job allocation. So we're building much more you kind of um, automated intelligence into the device. And that's the I suppose that's the level four. That's the ultimate, if you like, in terms of our user scenarios. And that's where we've got people like the building services guys working. So the, the the way that we do it builds on this in, in this way. So mobile access is a is the managed device with email, unified comms and collaboration. Um, with the capture and information is dealt with just by a simple application development. And as we go across this diagram, things become more complex and just take a little bit longer to deploy. Um, if it's integrated to a back-end business application, it obviously uses the integration tools. And if it's a full task and case system as it is in building services, then we, we, we use roster and scheduling. Um, the attraction of doing it this way is we can start we can start a business area on say a basic capture and information basis and get some benefits out of that, and then build on the additional bits later. So we're not actually looking for, you know, we're not actually going for the the end point right at the start if that's not necessarily the best way of achieving benefits early. So thinking about the future, this this is going back to this point about device independence not being hostage to a single app. We don't want a situation where we find that certain devices can't be used with certain applications. That this this assures us that whatever we build can transfer from one um, device to another fairly simply. Um, and that just echoes that point there. We're also looking at obviously bring your own device in, or choose your own device. Uh, the ability for, for in some scenarios for users uh, and staff to use their own devices. So for instance, we've now got online expenses. We'll be looking shortly at how, how to extend that onto the uh, you know, person's own device. There's no need for us to supply a device for that. Um, the way we've done this in terms of device independence makes sure that you know we can support whatever um, device people happen to choose to use for their own domestic purposes. And the other advantage is it keeps it native. Um, the, the great thing about the Total Mobile solution is that it actually reformats and represents the application based on the, on the, on the, I suppose, on the style of the device concerned. So an Apple uh, device will operate, an Apple kind of application that we roll out will, will behave in terms of swipes and gestures and whatnot in the same way that any other Apple device, Apple application would work. Android, it's the same. It would adjust that and, and make sure that somebody who's full fee with Android can use it. Um, again, not every mobile application uh, solution actually works that way, and we think that's quite key to making sure that things can be usable and don't feel alien. In terms of Apple, being the application agnostic, um, we talk about the BlackBerry experience, and what we mean by that is we changed our email system back in 2010 from Groupwise to uh, Outlook, and one of the things that we noted through that was that the, the people who were least disrupted by this were the people using Blackberries. Why? Because Blackberry it was just the, the Blackberry, if you like, was the point of um, um, it, it was basically a window on the back end email system, and it kind of negated the need for there was no changes required in terms of the user experience on the Blackberry, and we want to continue that. So, in the in the, in the sense of rolling out, say, a home care solution, if we currently integrate that with Swift, but we want to change the social care system at some point in the future, the front end in terms of the application on the on the device won't change. Um, we will just put the right integrations in, but, but keep the front end the same. So that is something we think will be quite useful in future as we retire legacy applications. And the other thing is we're thinking about cross-agency now in terms of pulling data together from other systems, for instance, the NHS, Fife, and social care into one screen. So again, the technology we use is, is ready for that. 
uh, type of um, solution. And in Fife, like in most areas of Scotland, we need to have a solution which works where we don't have a signal. Despite what Vodafone and 3 and others will tell you, it's still not universal um, in terms of data coverage and, and uh, the solution has to basically securely store data on the handset and, and without the user having to do anything specific, once it's back in coverage, it, it will then synchronise back to and send the data on. So in summary, um, one of the key, key takeaways is we didn't try to do a whole organisation business case. We did a business case based on 2,680 staff. Uh, that was sufficient to justify an enterprise in, in investment in this. So anything we've delivered beyond that, if you like, is, could be regarded as a bonus. I mean, we do track the benefits and make sure that they're logged, but, um, but, the, uh, but we didn't try to eat the elephant in terms of doing a business case that covered 11,000 staff. That would, have been, uh, that would have taken us significantly longer. The business case was good enough to, to, to create an ROI which was sufficient. Um, but we did plan for a whole organisation solution, so when we did the, the year zero, we did make sure that we were taking co cognizance of enablers and making sure that when we put gap, we filled the gaps, we were filling the gaps on the basis that the whole organisation might use it at some point. Going back to the year zero approach, um, it's absolutely essential that you do measure and, and you're also prepared to adjust. I mean, what we, we did find that, you know, we had product activity measures, for instance, in terms of flexible working that up to 10%, which we found in the reality we weren't going to, weren't going to stack up. Um, it was not the major part of the business case, so that was fine, but, but, but we were prepared to adjust and, and, and take baselines on that. And also take a broad view on the enablers. It's not just about the technology, it's about the cultural aspects and how people manage and, and all sorts of things. It's not just about how we're going to put an iPad in somebody's hands. Go back to mobile and flexible, they are different beasts. Um, flexible, the benefits are really from office reduction, um, I would say, and, and mobile, um, the benefits are from re-engineering the process and then slicking it up with the technology, and those are two different ways of approaching those two areas which are, which are essential if you're going to really release benefits from these. And my final plea is to think about a future tolerance solution. Uh, we, even, even I sitting in IT can't tell you what devices and what operating systems will be in place in two or three years. Uh, we know it's quite a fast-moving um, target, so we have been quite deliberate in saying we're not going to be making decisions on, on standard devices or whatnot. We'll make sure that the solution will support a range of devices and that we can move things as, you know, as for instance, devices come on stream. So one of the examples of that, we're looking at Microsoft Windows technology now. We use Apple and Android. But um, going forward, it may well be that Microsoft have got better solutions and, and cheaper solutions in this space. Um, but it won't matter to our mobile users because we will just move those applications across the device without any re-engineering. So it just thank I'll, I'll just falls to me to just thank you for your attention, and I'm quite happy to take any questions, as David says, on how we've how we've approached this and what the and what our experience has been. Okay, I'd just like to invite you to um, answer, uh, put any of your questions in the right-hand box just now. Um, we've got a first question in from a. Uh, my colleague Lee Brown at Improvement Service. I'll just try on mute you, Lee. Hello, Lee. All right, David. Um, uh, Charlie. Oh. Hi, Lee. Hi. <laughs> uh, my question was, sorry, just uh, with the benefits made in Fife, um, have you been able to realise or gather any evidence on mobile flexible work and how it's improved the customer experience or the customer services? Um, yeah, I mean, obviously, we, in terms of the in terms of the building services analogy on mobile, um, we have had positive feedback from customers because what, one of the things that obviously um, we're looking at integrating now is um, is sending a text when somebody's on their way, um, so that, that that fills I suppose that fills two objectives. Not only the customer got an assurance that they're on their way, um, but it also means that you know we we typically have. Um, no shows, if you like, when people just nip out the shops. It's Murphy's Law. We, we get uh, our plumber turns up and somebody just nipped out for 10 minutes. <laughs> uh, so we have got much higher hit rate now in terms of um, and people turning up and people being there and people knowing we're coming. But in addition to that, we've taken some some steps to make sure that anything that we update uh, in terms of the in terms of status on the handheld is actually reflected back in the, the lagging CRM. So if even if you phone the contact centre and say is this guy coming or what, what's the situation? They can they can probably give a fairly up to date view of what the situation is with the, the job in hand. Um, we will be working more closely with uh, with customer uh, in the next phase um, to try and develop that customer journey aspect of what we do. You know, because I think we, there's 
probably more we can do in terms of um, looking at these looking at these jobs as they go around the handhelds and as they're following through and 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 looking at how we can improve the customer engagement with that. Yeah. Thanks, Charlie. Does that answer your question, Lee? Yeah, that answers it. Perfect. Thanks, Charlie. No problem. Uh, next no problem. one. Next one's from Sean Crawford, who's joining us from London today. Hello, Sean. Hi, Sean. Sean. Oh, I'll just. It doesn't seem like he's got the audio working. So it um, says, a quick question: How did you address temporary workers' training and devices? Temporary workers. Does it, did you say that they would? Sorry. Yeah, temporary workers. Yeah. Um. Well, I suppose that depends on the nature of the temporary worker. But if we've got if we've got contracted workers, um, they they just get, you know and they're, they're fulfilling. I suppose they're fulfilling the the, the, the job of a permanent. Then we just we just treat that exactly the same. It's just it's just that they will have a device for the duration of their contract, and then that will be that will be returned to the pool, so to speak. Um, but then the areas we've ruled out, we don't have a great deal of temporary working, so it's not been something that's hit us uh, particularly. When it comes to flexible working, if that's where we're you know, about the office accommodation, um, again, when we, we, we did the dialo studies, um, we, we, we were, I suppose, at a fairly typical level in terms of temporary workers and whatnot. So, you know, the, the dialo studies, anything done on 8 to 10 or whatnot, was on the basis that there was a significant chunk of the workforce, I suppose, already temp or temporary working. And they're just assigned temporary passes and IDs in the same way that um, they would have been in the past. Um, and I suppose again, it's the, the major onus is on, on managers being able to manage in those situations. You know, I suppose if, in the case of a temporary worker, if you're not familiar with the worker you, or you're not familiar how competent they are, they, they may be working in a particular location until everybody's comfortable, they know their job, and we know that they can do their job. Okay, thanks very much, Charlie. Um, the next question is from Fiona McDonald at East Ayrshire. Um, it doesn't appear that she's got audio either. Um, you mentioned SWIFT. Has this been rolled out to social care and have you integrated Total Mobile with SWIFT? Uh, we're in the process of um, home care is a, is, is a significant project for us between, to deliver between now and April as part of the phase two rollout. So we are, we are integrating SWIFT into the TM solution as we go. Um, so that, that is part and parcel of, of, of what we're doing. Um, so, so the answer to that is not yet, but it is in hand. It's definitely uh, something that we are in the process of doing right now. Okay, and uh, the next question is just from Cammy Mackay. He was wondering, will this presentation be available later to download view? Um, I can answer that one. Um, we'll have, we ha this is a recorded session, so we'll be sharing the, the, the full recording and plus the slides once they become available on uh, several Knowledge Hub groups. We'll also be sending out the sending out links and uh, how, how to access this in a follow-up email. Um, so I think that's um, all the questions that we've got in for the moment. So um, I'd like to thank Charlie very much for uh, for his presentation today and taking the time to deliver that. I'll just uh, switch over to my screen where I can get um, a few. I've got a few useful links here that will be handy specifically for accessing the recordings. Um, a couple of Knowledge Hub groups, as we mentioned, this is part of the Change Managers Network Knowledge Hub series. Um, we're welcome to join the group, but uh, membership is restricted to Scottish local authority members only for the, at present. Um, the second group is the Mobile and Flexible Working across the public, Scottish public sector. It's um, a couple of my colleagues run this from within the Improvement Service. And uh, as I understand, um, there's no restrictions on joining that one whatsoever. Um, both the recordings and the presentation slides will be made available on those groups. So if you go into the Knowledge Hub and, and search for them, then uh, we can then we can approve your application. As mentioned, this is a uh, this is a part of a webinar series. So um, the link here on the, um, the Improvement Service website will give access to all the previous webinars that we've had. So we've got one in there about the benefits of benefits management, for example. Another one about how Lean has been implemented within Aberdeenshire Council. So if you go into that, then you can see the details of how to access previous webinars and upcoming webinars. 
And finally, uh, for any inquiries or information regarding this webinar series, then you can contact myself directly at david.morton at improvementservice.org.uk. Um, as I mentioned, we'll have a short follow-up survey where we can get a bit of uh, information about the pro um, what you thought of the webinar and what kind of webinars you'd like to see in the future. So, um, once again, thank thanks very much to Charlie for the session, and we'll get finished a little bit early um, unless we've got. Um, sorry, we've got one final question, and that's okay with you, Charlie. Yeah, that's no problem. Yep. Um, it's from David Hennigan from Glasgow City Council. How long did it take? Oh, yeah. Hi, David. Um, I'll just see if I can unmute him, actually. Um... Hi, David. Hello, David. Oh. Hello, David. He was wondering how long did it take to deliver the benefits? How long? Right. Okay. Um, well, the benefits. The, the benefits. Uh, we took the year zero, so we, we, the year zero was was quite deliberately set, so that we said we wouldn't deliver any benefits in year the, the first year of the program, and um, hence the term year zero. Um, the the benefits really started flowing from the, the point that we, in terms of flexible, was the point we started closing down offices. So really from year one onwards. But the, the bulk of the benefits were um, the, the the second and third years of the program. You know, it was the, the first year, if you like, was taken out with uh, with just doing the doing laying out the, the enablers and getting the getting that sorted out. Um, so really, year two and three um, was where we delivered the bulk of the benefits. Okay. And a lot of those benefits, I would say, are obviously recurring benefits now. So they're they're kind of um, kind of part and parcel of the the future or the current council financial situation, if you like. Okay, thank you very much, Charlie. So as mentioned before, uh, we'll, we'll just take that opportunity to finish up now. And thank you very much for your attendance. And I'll be in touch with uh, the with the details of how to access the webinar going forward. Thank you. No problem. Okay. Cheers. Thanks, Charlie. Thank you.